Welcome to Museums Matter, a series of FB live streams by the Vival Group, Chinatown Museum, and Iloilo Museum of Contemporary Art, in collaboration with Fundacion Senso and Ayala Museum. Museums Matter aims to be a platform for museums and a resource for teachers who are looking to museum collections to support digital learning. I'm Yuri Tamura, the museum officer and your host for the Museums Matter live streams. How museums support art collection, uh, how a museum art collection support digital learning will showcase art collections and museum programs from Ayala Museum, Fundacion Senso, and Ilo Mocha. It aims to teach teachers how to utilize our local art collections in preparation for blended learning. Today, we are joined by Marinela Andrea Tenten Mina, an associate curator of Ayala Museum, Ricky Francisco, the curator and director of Fundacion Senso, and of course, Janine Cabato, Curator for Education from Ilamoka. Before we begin, we'd like to open with a quote from Tristan Hunt, the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum based in the UK. Museums should use the long journey back to normality to renew their mission, connect with new audiences in new ways, and help reconnect the public with material works of profound creativity. In line with this quote, we'd like to put these live streams out there to better connect with the public through, of course, our teachers. The structure of today's talk will begin with a general description of the museum to be followed by a showcase of museum collections and museum programs, after which we will show the museum's online platforms and of course their contact information. Ayala Museum will be going first to be followed by Fundacion Senso and Ilomoka. So for our first speaker for today, we have Tentan Mina. She specializes in tradeware, ceramics, and indigenous Philippine textiles. She obtained her BFA in arts management from the Ateneo de Manila University in 2005 and is currently working on her master's in archaeology at the University of the Philippines Archaeological Studies program. She has 15 years of working experience under the Ayala Museum, working in different fields from education to collections management. She is a member of the Oriental Ceramic Society of the Philippines and the Kapisnan Archaeologist ng Pilipinas Incorporated, and has presented numerous papers on the Roberto T. Villanueva collection at local international conferences. Hello, Tenten. Welcome on to the show. Hi, Yuri. Thank you for the introduction. So first, I'd like to thank, of course, our organizers for putting this together. I think it's very timely that now we're talking about utilizing museum collections for blended learning. So the title of my presentation today is Museum Collections Make Connections. And this is actually borrowed, in a sense, from the theme of the International Museum Day back in 2014. And our subtopic is actually Digital Educational Resources for Blended Learning. I thought that the theme of the 2014 International Museum Day was appropriate for our topic because museum collections really are multifaceted objects. Um, in short, there are things which are connected to many things in about people. Uh, we learn a lot from objects, uh, not just because of their aesthetics, but because of the different contexts that are tied in with them. And that ties in with the reason why I also placed here our iconic dioramas. So in the next slide, what you'll find there is a focus on diorama number 34. Although this is technically part of the historical collections of the Ayala Museum, the dioramas which we are most closely associated with can also actually be considered as an artwork in itself. It was created by a team of historians, researchers, uh, artists and craftsmen in order to communicate a specific message. So going on, uh, we'll talk a bit about the history of Ayala Museum. So Ayala Museum actually began as the brainchild of Fernando Sobel, the visual artist and painter and philanthropist. But his plan to have a Museum of Philippine history and iconography was actually carried out eventually in the 1960s by Carlos Quirino, who was the first director of the Ayala Museum. And it opened in 1974. This is the original structure of the museum. But fast forward a few years, you'll see that 30 years later in 2004, we reopened with new facilities. So this is where the Ayala Museum is currently housed. And the Ayala Museum actually also as a structure houses 
the other half of the Arts and Culture Division of Ayala Foundation. So from being focused primarily on just art and history, we are actually also really part of an arts and culture arm of Ayala Foundation. The other half of that would be the Filipinas Heritage Library. When the museum first opened as a museum of Philippine history and an iconographic archive, it also housed a large holding of important reference materials and photographs, which would eventually become part of the Filipinas Heritage Library collection. But I'll talk a bit more about that later. Right now, I guess we'll go back to the main point of our presentation, which is really focusing on museum collections in general. So in the next slide, what we have there is a quote from Paul Perrault, who wrote in the Smithsonian Experience back in 1977 that collections are the reason for the existence of museums. They are the source from which a museum's unique role in the cultural fabric of society emanates. And they are the basis of its contribution to scholarship, the instrument of its educational role. So museums collect objects and they preserve them primarily, not just for the preservation of objects, but because there's a lot to be learned from these objects. So we'd like to highlight here the educational aspect of museums. So in the next slide, you'll find there that the educational role of the museum is actually quite unique because it's based on the object, which is a direct link to a specific time, place, event, and person. It's really uh, objects which come with rich contexts. And I think that's where we'd like to discuss in terms of the museum, the richness of how we can approach our different collections. So in the case of Ayala Museum, our collection actually is arranged according to these categories. They're considered as archeological, ethnographic, fine arts, historical, or numismatic. We'll go a bit through each so that we can be clear about what we mean. But what's interesting, especially about the numismatic collection, as we find in the next slide, it sounds like a complicated term, but numismatic actually refers to money. Um, in the case of the Ayala Museum, our numismatic collection also includes uh, philatelic materials or stamps. And these are very interesting also because although when we normally think of money, we associate it with history or economics, but these are actually also artworks in themselves because there was a lot of design and thought and context that went into the creation of these. For example, the five peso bill that you find on the upper left section, which was issued in 1912, if you look at the design of it, it's quite ornate. But that comes from a different histor historical period when you compare it to the design of the 20 peso bill, which was issued by the Mindanao Emergency Currency Board during World War II, which is very much simplified. So that in itself already tells us that even how design is executed is very much closely related to its historical context. Because the 20 peso bill at the bottom was actually executed during wartime, people couldn't really sit down to produce these prints, essentially, um, using very tedious processes. They needed to be able to execute them quite quickly and efficiently. And at the same time, the quality of the paper also varies. Um, and that's also related, again, to the historical context of the time. But these materials are also, in a way, a sense of, well, they celebrate personalities and um, the government as well. <laughs> so for example, in the stamps that you find on the right, you have their commemorative stamps, which talk about uh, the martyrdom, in a sense, of Del Pilar, Gregorio Del Pilar. And at the same time, a commemorative stamp for uh, President uh, Quezon, um, which was done actually as part of a drive on awareness on tuberculosis, which we know actually was relevant to um, the story of Quezon's death. Now, when we move on to through history, the, of course, the Ayala Museum is associated primarily with its dioramas. But aside from that, the historical collection also includes important historical photographs. There are albums such as Neely's photographs of fighting in the Philippines from the American period. And we also have a rare set of copies of the Noli and Fili, which were given by the mother of Rizal to the Onghunko family who eventually donated it to Ayala Museum. And again, these are rich in historical context, but they are also in a sense works of art. 
And the Ayala Museum's dioramas were also created to be supplemented by our maritime vessels and also a set of dolls, which you see there on the right. Now, maybe we'll take a quick break from um, the bit academic discussion, but we'll go into it. We'll take a quick quiz. Let's see uh, who's familiar with our national artists since our topic is actually the fine arts section. So you'll see on your screen there um, a question or a poll and you can answer. So our question is, which artwork was created by the national artist? Um, is it A, Una India a Manila Vestida a Degala by Damian Domingo, B, Lady at the Racetrack by Juan Luna, or C, Study for 500 Years of Philippine History by Botong Francisco? And all of these artworks are part of the Ayala Museum's Fine Arts Collection. So I guess while people are answering, um, we'll wait for the results of that. But while people are still typing in their answers, what we'll do is go through the some examples of the fine arts collection of Ayala Museum rather quickly. So normally when we speak of art, it's really within the context of how we were trained to perceive art from a Western point of view. And that refers to paintings and sculptures and these in themselves are also, again, very interesting documents of the periods which created them. For example, you have there the work by Damian Domingo showing how people were dressed in the 19th century Philippines. Beside it, you have the work by Juan Luna, who, although we know is a Filipino painter, actually also spent a lot of time during his studies in Europe. So a lot of his subjects were actually uh, they exhibit European features because he did a lot of these works while he was abroad. And then quite in contrast to that, you have decided a work by Fernando Sobel, uh, who belongs to the modern period in the Philippine art history. So while it shows us the different concerns and the different uh, styles of different periods, these objects, again, are interesting because you can talk about them from very different points of view and beside that we also have another interesting aspect of the fine arts collection uh, this is actually a series of paintings or sketches by merton brown who is an american soldier based in the philippines during uh, world war ii so he was doing sketches of the destruction of manila so he did sketches of the destroyed churches, the destroyed marketplaces, and so on. So these can be studied from a point of view of, for, of their artistry, um, their execution, their material, but also they show you uh, as historical documents what was happening in the time that they were made. And underneath all of that, we have their uh, set of studies by Botong Francisco, who is our national artist. Uh, well, one of our national artists, rather. And I think, let me see, did we get it right? According to our poll, most people actually voted for Juan Luna as a national artist. So unfortunately, while Juan Luna is considered very much a hero, um, by technicality, he is not an actually one of our national artists. The National Artist Award actually was given out by the Philippine government only beginning in the 1970s. So our first national artist was actually Fernando Amor Solo. And Botong Francisco was award given the same award the following year. Now, so let's go back to our presentation. Moving on, when we talk of art, again, normally we speak of it from the perspective of uh, painting, sculpture, from the concepts of the Western world of art. But when we think of the Philippines, we're actually a country that has, is very rich in a lot of uh, indigenous culture. We have a lot of variety of our expressions, whether they're related to our beliefs, to our way of life. So in this slide, you, what you'll find are, are ethnographic collections of Ayala Museum. These are some examples. So we have there a Kinabigat from the north, and that's very much closely related to the beliefs of the locals, their rituals, especially with regards to protection um, and community. And then also there are different kinds of adornments or accessories that people wear, objects 
which are also related to warfare and ceremonies such as the Kaliseko, and even objects which are related to rituals of friendship, such as the offering of betel nut chewing or betel quid. Uh, so you have there a kolokate, the kind of scissors that are used for opening up the uh, betel nut, and also a lotoan from the Maranao in the south. So again, while these objects are very rich in terms of design, I guess they're uh, most easily accessible to a lot of people because of their very unique designs. They're also tied in not just to design, but to a specific belief system and a specific culture, which I think is very relevant to our topic now of blended learning, because when we speak of blended learning, it sort of breaks down our traditional walls of how we understand we should be learning things rather than breaking down objects into different facets, we should be able to look at them holistically and tie that into the people that made them and such. Now, the last section actually of the museum's collection, oh, before we go into the last section, we also have another poll. This one is non-academic. It's just for a bit of fun. So let's try to see what's the most popular style, I guess, currently in terms of your taste. These are actually all part of the archaeological collections of the Ayala Museum. So would you, for example, uh, prefer to have accessories uh, made out of gold or perhaps made out of natural materials such as shell? Or would you prefer to get something imported <laughs> such as the trade beads? So while people are answering, um, let's move back uh, into our pr main presentation. So the archaeological collections actually speak of objects which are excavated, uh, retrieved from under the ground in a systematic manner. And this actually tells us a lot of fascinating things about cultures of the more distant past. And this can be revealing about their technology. For, for instance, you have there in the upper left a pair of stone tools. So it tells you about how people... Uh, navigated the world around them, what kind of technology did they have? Or again, it could be these objects could be related to their sense of style, uh, such as the accessories we featured earlier. Um, the trade beads in particular are quite interesting because again, these are objects which could not be produced locally, so they had to be sought from external sources. So it shows us something about the concept of how people appreciated things. Did they have to be uh, made locally? Did they have a preference for locally made objects? Did they have a preference for things which were imported and such? And lastly, uh, of course, but not the least, these objects are also re revelatory about people's concepts of uh, life, death, and the afterlife. So the last object you find on this screen actually is an example of a limestone burial jar uh, from Cotabato. So let's see, what is the most popular accessory? And most people, oh, it's actually quite close between gold and trade beads, 38% and 37%. So that's quite interesting. So I guess there's a sort of a close tie between the two, but not to say that the shell bracelet is far behind. It's at 25%. Okay, very interesting to know. So I guess gold really is still uh, top of mind when we speak of accessories. And that's also fascinating in the sense that, of course, gold is one of the most, well, it's abundantly accessible in the Philippines and it's part of our rich heritage and we should celebrate that. Now, moving on, when we speak of heritage, I mentioned at the start of the presentation that the Ayala Museum is actually one half of the arts and culture arm of Ayala Foundation. Now, when the museum started as a museum of Philippine history and iconographic archives, I mentioned that a lot of the holdings actually were part of a library that was also housed within the museum's facilities. So now these are formally part of the Filipinas Heritage Library, and that includes a large collection of photographs, very important photographs from the Retrata collection. And very interestingly enough, the 
uh, FHL, as we call it, uh, the Philippines Heritage Library is also now reaching out to uh, the public through Spotify. So they also have a collection of music called the Himig Collection. This is Filipino music. And they've started putting up playlists on Spotify. So if you have a Spotify account, please look them up. Uh, that's the Filipinos Heritage Library. But if you're looking for more serious resources, uh, you can visit the library's website. And this is how you'll find access to their collections, which includes a lot of important books, rare materials, especially regarding World War II. So the Filipinos Heritage Library has really been gearing itself towards uh, digital researchers for the last few years. So they have quite a lot of digitized material readily available if you're looking for resources that you need, um, not necessarily for teaching tools, but rather as reference for yourselves as you're developing your lesson plans, then I think that the Filipinos Heritage Library could be very helpful in that regard. And they also have a lot of interesting materials like the presidential papers of Quezon and Quirino. Now, of course, we have to speak about how you can access the museum's collection. And that's most easily done if you visit us at our main website. That's www.ayalamuseum.org. So when you go to the museum website, what you'll see there is a header that says that, unfortunately, we've been closed actually since June of last year, uh, even before the start of the COVID pandemic. But at the same time, since we've been closed last year, the museum made a conscious decision really to start reaching out digitally. Uh, so we've been trying to bring our offerings, not just uh, to the public through the museum's uh, physical space, but rather we've been bringing it outside through our Ayala Museum on the Go program, which includes off-site exhibitions. So we traveled some exhibitions to other sites outside of the museum premises. We were in Ayala malls for some time and also um, in schools. And we've also really beefed up our online programs uh, in line with this because uh, we understand, again, that the mandate of the museum is primarily to use its uh, collection as an educational tool. So we've really been trying to bring that forward over the last few, well, over the last year, I would say. So when you go, scroll down through our website, what you'll find also is that we have recently reorganized our content um, to include our art from home campaign, our online resources and educational resources. Whereas previously, the content of the museum website was organized according to our traditional programs, um, exhibitions, educational programs, etc. Now it's arranged really for your online needs. So if you go to the art from home page, um, which you'll find in the next slide, this is just to give you an example of what you'll find there. It's really actually um, a sort of light challenges, I would say, um, that people can do to sort of uh, inspire people to be creative. And these are just light uh, campaign materials really that our marketing department created in order to inspire people to really think about, uh, think creatively, I would say. Um, during these times. And this really began when the COVID uh, pandemic started because we realized that uh, thinking creatively is very helpful for a lot of people as they're going through this very difficult period. And the next section of the website is our online resources page. And that is arranged, actually, all of our traditional content you can find now in the online resources, such as our online exhibitions, uh, materials related to crafts um, and workshops and so on. And then, but I know that this talk is geared primarily towards uh, educators. So when you go to the museum website, the easiest thing actually is if you need access to our museum's educational resources, you can click the link at the top of the site, um, the resources page, and that will take you directly into our educational resources page. And this is where we've rearranged and housed all of our digital material. And we've actually been fortunate enough that as part of Ayala Foundation, we also 
uh, collaborated with uh, teachers from Santex a public school, which is run by Ayala Foundation, to really understand better what it is that teachers need as teaching tools during this time. So we rearranged the materials according to the MELCs or the uh, most essential learning competencies. And so you, what you'll find there is that we, you can actually click on any of the links below. So that's for the lower school, middle school and high school. And the content is already pre-organized according to topics which are most relevant to these different year levels. But if you can't find what you're looking for, you can also just click the link below and send us an email. That's hello at ayalabuseum.org. So again, I think that the museum is really focusing now on making our collections most accessible, especially to educators. So we'll just go quickly through the content of the different sections. Uh, but what you'll find that most of the materials that are there are actually videos, which we've been creating since last year, but we've rearranged them thematically again, according to the different subtopics that might be relevant to your curriculum. Now, aside from videos though, we also have a few examples of activity sheets, which our education department has been very busy uh, working on. Um, and this is one example of that. It's a coloring, it's part of the coloring book that they developed on Philippine art. So we think that this can be used by teachers of different year levels because you can, again, approach it from different perspectives. You can talk about the artwork from the perspective of color, composition, or you can talk about the style, the fashion of the times, or even about Juan Luna himself. So we've included in the page a bit of information about the artwork and, of course, a bit of context as well. So that's a general teaching guide. Now, when we speak of approaching materials from different contexts, I think that there's also one fascinating example that we did before. Uh, this was from two study guides, which we had developed in, uh, in line with our exhibition, Art and the Order of Nature in Indigenous Philippine Textiles. So again, these are materials, these are ethnographic materials, which can be studied from different perspectives. You can look at them from the view of geometry and design, or you can analyze them from the context of the people that made them or the weavers. So we'll just go quickly through the contents. These guides were developed specifically in line with that exhibition, but right now we are focusing on translating the content of some of the study guides which we had developed prior and being able to make that available to the general audience also on our website. But again, I think it's interesting that, let's say, for example, these textiles, these threads, you can look at them from the perspective of the people that made them, what were their belief systems, uh, what were the colors that were accessible, and thus also what were the colors that were important, and what was the technology available. Or you can look at it from an entirely different perspective and that of design. So because normally when we speak of geometry, we think it's related only to a math subject. And I will admit I was very bad at math, <laughs> but I was fairly good at geometry. And I think that that's because geometry in itself actually is a subject that is based on what is observed about the measure of the earth. So it's something observable and something that can be translated into design. And it's again, reflected also in terms of symmetry uh, in our material culture. So these are just a few examples. And then I guess to close, I also have here a short video uh, just to give you an example of what we have available on our YouTube channel. And I'll just ask them to put up our video. Okay, so that was just a very short trailer actually that we had launched before when we first opened up our YouTube channel. 
but that was just to get you a little excited about what else you can possibly find. Um, again, if you need access to materials about the museum's collection, you can visit us at our website at www.ayalamuseum.org. Or you can also look us up on social media. We're very active there on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and again, on our YouTube channel. Or if you still need help or with trying to find something very specific, then please don't feel, uh, please feel free rather to reach out to us via email at hello at ayalamuseum.org. And I guess that's it. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Denton. That was such an informative talk. I hope our teachers are aware about how many resources museums actually have for them. So if any of the teachers listening in right now are interested, please connect with Ayala Museum with these um, links or on these social media profiles. And yeah, maybe you can cook up something together for this incoming online school year. Okay, so moving on, our next speaker will be from Fundacion Senso. Ricky Francisco is currently the director of Fundacion Senso. He has been working with private museums since 1999 and has an independent curatorial practice since 2011. Among the institutions he has served are the Ayala Museum, the Lopez Museum, and the Perita Kahlo Foundation, and of course, the Singapore Tyler Print Institute. He is a member of Call Asia Project, which advocates for preventive conservation of museum collections in museums and heritage sites around Southeast Asia. So everybody, let's please give Sir Ricky a warm welcome. Hello, Sir Ricky. Thank you, Yuri. That was so kind of you. Uh, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Um, I hope you're enjoying what you've been seeing so far. Uh, Tenten's talk was so good and I learned so much from it. Uh, thank you, Vival Group, for hosting this and for thank you, Chinatown Museum and Ilomoka for uh, giving us this platform today to share what we have at Fundacion Senso. I hope everyone there is sheltering safely and let's continue. <laughs> um, Fundacion Senso is a small private art museum devoted to uh, preserving and promoting the legacy of one man, Juvenal Senso. Um, we run a small museum an archive, a library, as well as some um, foundation, a foundation which gives grants and scholarships. Uh, we are also known for our own small cafe and our museum shop. We are located in San Juan, Metro Manila. You know, uh, Fundacion Senso is quite out of the way, so we try to make it as easy as possible for everyone. Um, we have this short poll. Um, it says, how much is the entrance fee to visit the museum in Fundacion Senso? Uh, so I'd like to ask the teachers to guess how much that is. And before, while, while I'll give time for, for people to answer, I'd like to share more about Fundacion Senso. Um, unlike other private art museums here in Manila, Fundacion Senso is largely self-funded. And unlike other art museums here in Manila, we just, we don't take care of the art of the artist. We also take care of the artist himself. So uh, aside from the artworks of Mr. Senso, we also take care of his well-being as he is now, uh, he has celebrated his 90th birthday last year. So uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, he can no longer visit us, whereas before he would be with us every day. So, okay, uh, maybe we could take a look at if ever there's enough uh, at, at the poll, yeah. Okay, so Ricky, I don't think, oh, the answers are here. Perfect. So, wow. Wow, okay. Actually, the, the poll is, okay. The poll says that we have 38% who said that it's free. Yes, you are correct. Um, Fundacion Senso has been offering um, free entrance since 2019. Um, we believe that art should be for everyone and we don't want to let um, entrance fees be a deterrent. So we, we like to reach out to various audiences and one of the ways that we do that is giving free entrance to everyone. We are open usually from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Sunday. However, during this pandemic, uh, as much as we want to open, we're only open online. 
Um, okay. Well, the museum collections is largely the artworks of Juvenal Senso, whom you could see in that slide. He's the man being awarded uh, at the right with the cross of Isabella. Um, Mr. Senso has been doing artworks for 70 years. He is a Spanish citizen by birth, but he grew up here in the Philippines. From 1932 up to the present, he has resided in the Philippines um, on and off. And he is recognized by the Philippine government with um, the Presidential Medal Awards. Um, it's the highest award that a foreigner can get. Um, Spain also gave him the Cross of Isabella. And France knighted him as a Knight of Arts and Letters. Um, he is exhibited and collected by museums worldwide. And we are very lucky that he chose to have his own museum here in the Philippines. Fundition Senso houses approximately 700 paintings from 1948 until 2012. Um, we also have some of his drawings and prints. Um, we have 60 etchings and fine art prints, which should not be confused with commercial prints. Fine art prints, like etchings, are original and authentic works that the artist himself has made, um, and they're considered multiple originals. Uh, they made Unlike a painting, which could be just one in uh, uh, one unique work, uh, print is an original work that is numbered and signed and inspected by the artist himself. So aside from the prints, we have 2,300 slides, uh, 1,500 fine art photographs done by Senso. Uh, not many people know him to be a photographer, but he is. And we, we have around 1,000 opera, set and costume designs. We have another poll. Can an art print be an authentic work? So I'll let you answer that while I share uh, an anecdote. Uh, we went out one day, um, Fundacion Senso had a booth in Art Fair Philippines, and a collector approached us and asked us, is that work by Juvenal Senso? It was an etching from 1955. And we said, yes, it's an etching by Juvenal Senso. Oh, but that's not, uh, that's, not, that's not a real work, no? No, no it's by Juvenal Senso himself. Inukit niya po yan sa copper. Uh, he drew it on copper using acid and uh, metal, metal tools, and then he printed it on paper. But that's a print, sabi niya ganyan. Uh, that could not be an original work. Oh, no, sir, it's an original work. Parang pera lang po yan. Uh, if you have 100 pesos printed by the Philippine government, it's still 100 pesos. Kahit na magpalit-palit kayo ng 100 pesos, it's still 100 pesos. It still has its own value. It's still a different 100 pesos from a fake 100 pesos. A real 100 pesos has value. It's authentic and it's original. Tara, let's see the, the poll. Um, maybe we could check out what the poll is on this. Can an art print be an authentic artwork? Okay. Wow. I'm very happy to see that 93% of our teachers believe that an art print is an authentic work. Tama po kayo. Um, I'm very glad that uh, we do not have that mis misunderstanding uh, that prints cannot be original and authentic. They, they can be if they are fine art prints. Moving on, um, I'd like to share with you that we have changing exhibitions in the museum. We have several types. So we have changing um, in-house muse uh, museum exhibitions, which could be thematic Juvenal Senso exhibitions, purely our collections, or sometimes we invite contemporary artists over to react to the collection. So on the right, you will see a contemporary art exhibition. And um, we do that in order to give new meaning to the collection so that the, that the collection is enriched by interpretations of other artists. And uh, it's also one way to attract an audience. A lot of our audiences visit us because our changing museum exhibitions are only for two months on the average. We also visit other museums and have exhibitions outside. Uh, we really believe that art should be for everyone. So we try to get out of the museum and go out to where there are more people. Um, at the left is an exhibition we've had with Lopez Museum and um, that was in relation to their collection because they also have a very strong Juvenal Senso collection. 
We've also had exhibitions with Ayala Museum, the Purita Kalo Ledes Museum, the Vargas Museum, and we also have um, uh, exhibitions off-site, like in malls. So that way, we get to promote the legacy and uh, of, of Juvenal Senso to everyone. Next slide, we will take a look at another type of exhibition. Um, we've already started with augmented reality exhibitions as early as 2019. Um, we really wanted to do that so that we could go to schools. Uh, however, so we have those types of, um, if, you, if you take a look at the right, those are movable panels which can be transported to schools and they have their own lock and key so we can keep our uh, high, high, re high resolution reproductions inside during at, at night and then uh, during the day we could bring them out and have um, exhibitions in the schools so that uh, students can get to see his work. Um, however, due to COVID, this program had to stop. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Okay, because everyone is now online and we cannot go out most of the time, uh, we were able to work out with our guest curator, Dr. Dayang Iraula, our first online curated exhibition. Um, this current curated exhibition is called the Mutation Series. It's a reaction to the painted slides of, the, of Juvenal Senso. And we've had um, guest artists, Annie Pacanya, who created moving images in relation to the slides. And we've also had Tad Ermitaño, Rubber Ink, and the children of Cathode Ray to create sound. So if you have modules that are related to media art or sound art or uh, video art, you could take a look at mutationseries.adformarchitecture.com. It will be on until December. And we could create um, programs with you if you just contact us. Next slide, please. So this is what you'll be able to see. Uh, have a video. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So aside from our exhibitions, we also have a very important role in authenticating artworks by Juvenal Senso. Um, since we take care of his legacy, it's important that we weed out forgeries and fakes. Um, at the left, you will see uh, a lot of the works that we've been receiving. Um, these are fake artworks that are being passed off as the works of Juvenal Senso. This will harm his legacy because they are, they are not his. Um, and on top of that, because there's a really brisk trade of artworks by Juvenal Senso, even our certificates of authenticity are being forged and fake. Uh, telltale signs of certificates of authenticity that are uh, fakes are wrong spellings, such as at the right, take a look, or the logos are handwritten. Uh, our logo is the signature of Juvenal Senso himself, and this is uh, one way you can, uh, you can tell if it's not by him. Okay, aside from the authentication program, we also run um, e uh, exhibition-related education programs. Um, this exhibition was in partnership with co contemporary artist Linky Sumbing Ramilo, where, he ha where she had a library of um, wood from old houses. So we were able to work out a lecture series with 30 librarians on how they could use archival and library materials in part uh, to exhibit in their schools. Yeah. We are open to collaborations also with the art community. So we have this Senso Idea platform, which is a very uh, flexible platform. And we have several um, communities and ideas that we stick to. One of them is with the art community. Uh, and a project of this is the Art in the Garden, which is uh, basically inviting young artists over to our garden to have a selling exhibition of their works. Everything is below 10,000 pesos. And in this way, the artists get to 
to know their collectors and vice versa. The collectors get to know the artists themselves. So we've had two of these programs last year and perhaps we will soon migrate it online um, at the end of the year so that uh, we can continue doing it. Another Senso Idea platform is focused on museums. Um, we've had the chance to work with professionals like Ethel Villafranca um, to do a fundraising workshop for museums and not-for-profit not not institutions. We also created other platforms um, for museums, such as um, art handling workshops, uh, where we've had our own Veronica, uh, our own staff, uh, Veronica Fuentes, as well as guest um, speakers such as Mr. Lester Amasho, uh, imported from Dubai. Uh, he has been working with the Louvre Abu Dhabi and he shared his skills here locally through the art uh, handling workshop. So far last year, we've had six of these. And to make things easier because of the lockdown, yeah, next slide please. We also have it online for free. If you visit our page, Fundacion Senso, there are six videos on how you can handle art. Uh, this is done by our own staff, Veronica Fuentes. Um, another idea we focus on for the Senso Idea platform is mental health. Starting last year, we focused on mental health because we think that our community needs to be more aware that this is a problem and museums are places of healing. Um, we've, we've invited speakers like Dr. Robert Benaventura and Ms. Kathy Sanchez Babau to give lectures and workshops on this topic, as well as do it uh, online. Um, because right now we're all in our homes. And um, for example, this, this recent talk was, uh, was for our elderly. Um, everyone can be, ano kasi, like when we're in confined spaces for prolonged periods of time, uh, it could become a problem. So we reach out to our audiences this way as well. And everything is also free. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that is unique to Foundation Senso is our micro-grant program. We have grant programs for artists and curators. So a micro-grant program is a 10,000 peso grant so that uh, an artist can be able to use it in whatever way. Um, our first recipient was Mr. Roniel Compra, um, whose exhibition we've seen in Cebu. We were able to bring in his exhibition at Fundacion Senso through a microgrant, and he was shortlisted for the Ateneo Art Awards. Another, another grant that we have is our exhibition grants program. Um, this year, we've had our first curatorial grant program, and the first recipient is Dr. Dayang Iraola. And um, we've explored the painted slides with her because she focuses on sound art mostly. And we've never done sound art in the museum. So we were very lucky to have her. And her exhibition can be easily accessed through the link provided earlier. Uh, the last grant program that we have is a scholarship program. Uh, for two years now, we've been in partnership with the Bulacan State University. And we've had 14 art student scholars. and. Two of them have already graduated. We provide them with um, stipend for their works so that they could create works. And then we give them the chance to exhibit in Fundacion Senso once a year. And the, their exhibition is um, covered by our media partners. And we help them go into galleries so that they become full-fledged artists. Uh, aside from the students, we also work with their teachers so that, we uh, so that there's their teachers are updated in, in their skills regarding art teaching. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah, so please visit us at Foundation Senso. We have the Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And please email us. We're open to suggestions and collaborations. You have our email there and our telephone number. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ricky. Okay, so you heard it from Sir Ricky himself. If you would like any of the Fundacion's programs, please feel very free to get in touch with them. They are very, very willing to work with you all. And yeah, let's move on to our next museum. So our next museum is, of course, Ila Ila Museum of Contemporary Art, which is also a host for the live stream. So um, for Ila Moka, 
Janine Cabato, the curator for education, will be the one to give the talk. So Janine Cabato is currently the curator of Chinatown Museum at Binondo and Iloilo Museum of Contemporary Art at Iloilo Ilo, Ilo City. Sorry. She has previously worked for the Galleon Museum at SM Mall of Asia and NCCA-sponsored art festivals at Mindanao. Before putting up the Spark Museum at the La Salle Santiago Zabel School, she utilized her teaching license to share her love of art to high school students. She has an art management degree from Atenea de Manila University, and she is in her element when immersing in creative projects, museums, and education. She is, of course, most happy when she is with her dogs or in her hometown of Zamboanga City. So everybody, let's please give Janine Tabato a warm welcome. Hello, Janine. Welcome on, uh, or should I say, welcome back to the show. Hello, Yuri. Thank you for having me back here. I will give you a brief description of Ilomoka's collection and museum programs. But first, I would like to check if we have viewers here who are from Iloilo. Who has been to Ilomoka? Please comment below. Kumusta mga taga Iloilo? For those of you who who have not been to Iloilo yet, we are we are now connected at uh, Casa de Emperador Building. It is in Iloilo Business Park. So this is the property of Mega World, which is our uh, mother company. To give you more information about this, Ilomoka opened last March 2018. It is the first museum of Mega World and also the first museum in the Visayas region. So it's strictly dedicated to modern and contemporary art. The goal of Ilomoka is really to engage the community with the collections through exhibitions and museum programs. It is a three story building, it has five exhibition spaces. On its ground floor, we have one changing exhibition space and a souvenir shop. The other exhibition spaces are in the second and third floors. We also have a block box for, it's very perfect for theater and performing arts. The theater could hold around 75 people. This is pre-COVID. So post-COVID, uh, only half, right? As per IATF. So it could only accommodate only 30. But since the museum is still closed, um, as like most other museums, we will update you if we are already open again. But this is one of the reasons why we are doing Museums Matter because we would really like to share our collections and our programs online. Some of our collections are the sculptures from the Valencia collection. So it's segregated into a different, we have different slides about the collections. and. The Valencia collection is really a mix of prints also and uh, prints and sketches, right? So our patron, Ed Valencia, who is also from Iloilo, started collecting works in New York during the 1980s. So that's why this is more than around 30, decade, uh, 30, 30 years, so three decades. He has been collecting art and he con continuously also collects arts even during this quarantine, especially during this quarantine as most artists are very busy in their studio because they cannot leave it locked down, right? So when he was building his career in banking and finance, he also started to build on the art collection. The names that you could see here with the paintings are mostly on Filipino artists. Sir Ed is very particular with the paintings that he collects. So he's specially drawn to works that, and I quote, create new perspectives, new insights, and new narratives when you look at it again and again. I won't run through the list because there is many to mention, but currently the collection of paintings and just paintings alone are over 800. To bring this to the public, the museum is coming up with thematic exhibits which will start this August. So we will share that to you in a while. Just to have a poll also, we will check um, if you know the answer to this. What art movement is this painting categorized? What art movement is this painting categorized? A, abstract art, B, social realism, and C, impressionism. 
this work was created by the national artist um, Jerry Elizalde Navarro. So it's about Gunung Agong. It is an active volcano located in Bali, Indonesia. Very active ever since the mid 1800s, it already erupted. And its last recorded eruption was around May 2019. So um, I, if you don't know what Gunung Agong is, you wouldn't even know that it's a volcano. It's the, the artwork is very colorful. All right, answer below, please. We will see if you got it right. Teachers, I'm hoping that we have the correct answers. And okay, 64% of you answered correctly. The answer is abstraction. So it's abstract art. You can see that it is not a realistic representation of the active volcano. And it is done in representation of colors, shapes, and lines. Very happy that that was correct. All right. So going back to the collections, we have around... 100 paintings created by international artists. Most of these works really were collected by Sir Ed when he was in New York um, during his stint in the banking industry. So right now, Sir Ed is based in Iloilo. So we also have sketches and drawings. And in the coming weeks, we will also be making these collections accessible to the, plat to the, to the public through our online platforms. Most of our prints are also in, but we would really like to um, share with you what the Valencia family has because they would like to leave a legacy, not only to the city of Iloilo, but to the arts community. And um, actually, while we're going nationwide with this, we would like to share it to the entire country. Okay, so I will be sharing with you our past exhibits. This was done by Sir Ricky, who was our previous speaker. And uh, this was last year, right? And then we also have Tai Hope, which we, uh, which we collaborated with the first, first solo exhibition of Noel Elicana. Noel Elicana is a grant awardee of the 2018 Metro Bank Art and Design Excellence Award. So he also won for this coming, he was nominated for this coming year again, right? Our other artists that we also exhibited was on Ariel Zambrano, who is Iloilo based. And um, you could see here that Ariel is a social realist artist. This is his installation, which is entitled um, Calm Surface, Intense in the Underneath. It is composed of 34 concrete casts of the artist's own two legs and surrounding the installation are artworks, paintings about the working class. So you have construction workers, farmers, pedicab drivers. This Hulot Gallery is located in the ground floor of the museum. We also have collaborated with Sir Danny Alvarez. He is from uh, Yuchenko Museum, and he was our guest curator for the Connected Worlds of Contemporary Art. Right. So sometimes we bring in artists from Manila. We also have, uh, we showcase artists in the Visayas region, of course, and in the future, we would also like to showcase artists from Mindanao. Right. For our museum programs, Pre-COVID, we had Aigali. These are lectures on music, visual art, and theater and literature. So we also had artist talks and art workshops, which were held in the box. The box is our theater facility within the museum. When we shifted online, we would really like to engage the public more. So we created Ilomoka Art Club. And Ilomoka Art Club is really geared towards having, having the community put in artwork. So we bring in daily prompts on, during the weekdays. So there, this, this you could share to your students and let your students know that um, we, really, we really want to see their creative works online. Part of our online programs too, 
especially on Facebook and on Instagram, is Artist of the Day. So uh, these three artists are one of our top artists that people engage on. See, Christopher Basileño, we have Leo Gali, and Richard De La Cruz. So we also got a number of features from international artists. There, This is an ongoing campaign. It's an ongoing program. And we make sure that we really tap on the, the creative community. Right. So one of our programs also, of course, is Museums Matter. All of these, the videos that we have from the past uh, two, lecture, two, two lectures and also this lecture, we're putting it in YouTube. And we would also like to see you again for August 1. I would like to share that for August 8, we will be including Ateneo Art Gallery and also the MCAD of Benild. These are, this is our YouTube account and it's on, um, hold on. It's on YouTube. So we have, uh, please feel free to, uh, please feel free to uh, subscribe to our channel. Okay, for August, we will be having our first virtual exhibition. The title is based on the percentage of women artists in the Valencia collection. So we would like to know what you think is our answer for the 7.23% for the or 24.6% or 56.7%, the percentage of women artists in the collection. Please feel free to answer. You we heard this, Ja. Please feel free to answer it down below in the comments or at the poll. All right. Let's see what you have. A lot of people answered 24.6%. The honest answer is it's 7.23%, which is quite sad. We only have a few women artists in the Philippines. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we are creating 7.23%, which is the name of our exhibit this coming August 14. So this is also an invitation to everyone to please join us while we have conversations with these women artists together with Marika Constantino, our curator. And we will be having this at 7.23 p.m. In, by August 14. This will just be via Facebook Live. One of the things that we would like to share with you also is our schedule for August and September, which is, I will run through it, but for those who are using their cell phones, please screen cap this, or uh, rather you could also join us in Facebook, um, check, our, check our Facebook page so that you could always be constantly up updated with what's happening. All right, so for August 1, we will be having Teaching Philippine History with Museum Artifacts and Collections. This is in line with NHCP museums and, of course, with Chinatown Museum. So we have Museo al Deposito, Museo ni Emilio Aguinaldo, and Museo ng Katipunan. By August 8, also at 2 p.m., we will be having How Contemporary Museum Art Programs Support Blended Learning. This is together with University of Museums, which is Ateneo Art Gallery and Museum of Contemporary Art and Design at Benild. Right. By August 14, we have 7.23. It is a virtual exhibition. We are using Facebook and Instagram for the platforms for this. But the grand launch will be on August 14 at 7.23 p.m. Very exact. Right. So this is, we are joined with uh, Maureen Austria, Lira Garceliano, Ali Garibay, and Michelle Holanes Lua. So I'm very proud to say that all these artists are across the Philippines, so well represented. 
Maureen is from Bacolod. Lira is here in Quezon City. Ali Garibay is in Cavite. And Michelle is at uh, Cagayan de Oro. So our curator is also Iloilo based. So very far. Roja City. There. Okay, so on August 25th, to celebrate the Iloilo Charter Day City, we will have a virtual urban sketch together with Aurelio Castro III. Uh, his works were featured already in Rappler. He's been uh, very active with urban sketching, but this time we're doing a virtual urban sketch. So I'd really like you to push this with your students. This is very good because it he will do it um, online. We would encourage your students to also bring their um, art materials online. He will, we will do a sketch together. Okay. For September 10, we will already be showcasing our collections through the elements of art and principles of art. Very basic for um, around grades 8 to 10. This would be best fitting for those age range. Lastly, I would really like to do a call out for our Living in History program. This is with the COVID-19 collection. Next slide, please. We are living in a moment in history and especially in the pandemic. So as part of Mega World Museum's mission to be repositories of their respective communities, we are currently collecting masks, but only those made of Philippine textiles. So do give us a link. Let us know um, if you come across any hablon, yakan, ikat weaving. We are collecting them. And we are also buying it. But if you would like to donate, please reach us through Messenger also. We are sharing our links. This is our Facebook page. And also, you could contact us through Facebook, Instagram, and of course, our YouTube channel. For anything else, suggestions, collaborations, please feel free to email us. We will always reply as we are online all the time. Thank you, Yuri. Back to you. Thank you, Janine. Okay, at this point of the talk, we still have some time. So we will be bringing on our speakers back into, uh, quote unquote, the stage or on our little online space. And then we are open to taking some questions. So if you have any questions to these um, museum heads, now is the time to ask. It can be kind of difficult to have your questions directly or immediately answered through email. You know, that we don't get work on weekends and then we have some admin workloads. So if you have any questions, now is the time to really ask our speakers. So again, um, hello everyone. Does anyone have any questions for our speakers? So we have, okay, so again, um, does anyone have any questions for our speakers? Okay, so there are a lot of people thinking, there are a lot of people thinking us, but I don't know, do you guys have any questions? So, okay, so for, habang wala pa tayong questions, I have a question. How are you all doing with the digital online shift? So I know it's not easy because no one was prepared. It just happened and then we just had to deal with it. How have you all been doing with the digital transition? Uh, maybe Ten Ten from Ayala Museum would like to start. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. I guess I mentioned that uh, in a sense, we're fortunate enough that we actually started our uh, to boost our online presence really last year uh, when we closed the museum for innovation. So since the museum has been closed, we have already been actively creating content for the public through our online channels. And that's how a lot of the 
videos and educational materials, especially on YouTube, was developed. Um, although we're still continuing to develop some new material as well. But I think that uh, what, one of the things that uh, we really shifted towards now with the uh, COVID pandemic is that before, while we were offering our programs online and it was really to a more coincidental audience um, because our, the ma main audience really as a museum was still our visitors, the physical visitors of the space. But since we, because of the COVID pandemic, a lot of people have started to focus really on accessing museums digitally. Then we've started really to rethink what kind of content we should be making uh, rather than thinking of just general exhibitions. Um, rather right now we're focused on really working on educational material again for teachers and also especially for parents uh, who have their families, their kids who are at home, uh, especially parents who are working. Uh, we know that they're dedicated to the education of their uh, their children, but they might not necessarily have a readily available tool set uh, to aid teachers also in that aspect. So that's why we've sort of shifted in that direction. But generally, we have been online, I guess, uh, even as early, well, much earlier. So it's just that we've sort of had to think of particular or rather very specific audiences now that have different needs? Um, for us at Fundacion Sanso, we were very lucky because we were preparing to go to schools. We were preparing to go to bring the museum to the school because we are in San Juan, which is very accessible. Um, so when the lockdown happened, we already had 360 videos that we were able to upload online. And we had uh, a very reflect, uh, ref how do you say this? Our guest curator was very quick on her feet and we had an online exhibition during the ECQ. So mm -hmm. in that sense, we were somewhat fortuitously prepared. However, during the ECQ itself, our main focus was really on keeping everyone safe, all the staff that should be at home. And then later on, how, did we, how, how can we keep our audiences engaged and safe as well. So the mental health series, we had several. And then we also uploaded a lot of activity sheets. But I learned a lot from 1010 today. So we will be organizing those in albums, perhaps, so that teachers mm -hmm. may be able to access, to access them um, much more easier. Yeah. So um, right now, we're continuing our inventory, even though we are not open to the public. We're continuing our inventory so that we could be able to create better exhibitions when um, finally the GCQ is lifted. And um, we're also continuing our authentication services in our small, uh, with our skeletal staff. Uh, for that, though, you have to create an appointment. <laughs> okay. Thanks. For Ilomoka, we were not really prepared. And then what happened was we had to look through the collections to be able to come up with something online because everything is moving then. And looking through the, the we think the, the quarantine schedule is really going to be prolonged all the way up to at least early next year. So that's why as much as possible, we're really trying to fast track a lot of our collections and our museum programs online. I think this is the case for most museums also. And good thing that we have a very um, active team in Ilomoka and also in uh, Chinatown Museum. So there. You will definitely, if uh, you log on to our Facebook page, we will be adding more programs up. There, Yuri. OK, so we have quite a few questions coming in. So one of the questions is, do you have any printed materials that we can utilize in our lessons as supplemental instructional materials? So um, currently, well, because we're all under lockdown, we cannot just give you printed materials. Um, but does anyone want to answer if you have uh, materials that can be easily printed? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Ricky. 
<laughs> well, um, for us, we could send some of the catalogs that we have for our online exhibition, which is a sound art and motion art and media art, so that uh, we could send um, catalogs to you with the USB of the artworks so that you could use it in school. Just send us an email and we will take care of sending it to you. Okay, Tan Tan? Yeah, for Ayala Museum, again, uh, if you check out the educational resources page on the museum website, uh, you'll have to go through it a bit, um, in a sense. If you look through the different topics, you, you'll find there the listing of the available materials. Some of it is video, some of it is printable materials. So, for example, the coloring books, you can print that out. We are also developing some uh, additional uh, teaching guides, I suppose. Um, again, as I mentioned, we also, we're also translating, again, the uh, study guides which we did for the exhibitions before. We're reformatting them. Um, so the development of content is constant, but if there's something specific that you're looking for, then please uh, feel free to reach out to us and send us an email. For Ilomoka, we are currently building on our website. And part of that also is creating activities where it's easily downloadable in PDF form so that it's easy to print, right? So we've been working with uh, Kublai Milan for the coloring books, and we have also activity books there. Uh, but that will be in the near future. Okay, thank you for your answers. So I hope to whoever asked that question that we managed to give you some guidance on that matter. Next question, what link can I go to to access and download educational materials, particularly on Philippine art history? So I think this was also answered in the previous question. So you can either email the respective institutions or you can go to their websites to check out what they already have uploaded. Okay, we have an interesting question over here. So art slash museums have always been associated with the elite. Do you believe that it has become mainstream now? Thank you. So, Sir Ricky, I think... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that someone asked that question. I used to believe that too. I grew up in Baguio and um, the museums there were often very intimidating. Um, when I went to Manila and started working for Ayala Museum in 1999, that perspective changed a bit. And right now at Fundations and So, we are trying to change that perspective by going to malls, going to schools, and letting people enter the museum for free. So art is for everyone. As, as, it, as much as it is a human expression, it is for everyone. Yeah, Second I, emotion. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to add to what Ricky said. Um, I think I say, when we talk about museums, uh, we normally think of big intimidating edifices, no? But when we talk about the content of the museum, it really is related to the human experience. So the way that we understand the world is something innate to us all. So it's really a matter of allowing access. And there are different levels of access which museums have been working on. Uh, of course, first and foremost is the physical access. But our educational programs are also a way of allowing better access to our collections and the great content that they're tied with. Okay, um, Janine, do you have anything else to add or do we move on yes. to the next question? I have something to add. Uh, just recently when we talked to our art patron, he did mention that also, aside from making the collections more accessible, it's the content of the collections. So currently, because of the political crisis, most of the artists actually are into social realism. So the bulk of the collaborations with artists these days are really more of what's happening in politics, what's happening because of COVID. So before, you don't see any, any masks when you, when you do... Um, a self-portrait, but now meron na, right? So that in itself, yung content mismo, it's really not for the elite. It really is what's in touch with the masses and what's in touch with the public. Okay, so we have more questions talking about um, museum modules for remote and blended learning. So again, you can either approach the institutions or go to their website. Ayala has a... Um, 
um, modules on that for Fundacion, you have to go to them and um, ask for it yourself. And then for Ilamaka, it's up and coming. So let me, let me just check the questions. From the Ilamaka Watch Party, has your audience increased because of your online programs? Because mm -hmm. now do they technically reach more people? Do you find in-person programs slash exhibitions still draw more people? So ayan, um, on okay. the topic of engagement, do you feel like because we've now gone because now all of your energy is online you get more you get a larger audience as opposed to like a face-to-face -face kind of event um janine for ilomoka we've seen the increase every week so there's quite an increase because there is constant engagement and there's constant cost constant postings so also the live streams especially in connection with vibal and the connection that we did with um, DepEd, with the uh, OKKK Tambayan, brings in students and brings in teachers, which really are our main target audience. So that's what we want to do with Museums Matter. And uh, moving forward, when we push through with most of our virtual exhibits, uh, we really have to tie up with the schools to make sure that the students are the ones who are able to look into the narratives and the perspectives that we would like to showcase with our collection. Okay, um, Ben Ben? Yeah, um, I think that in our case, well, I'm not quite sure of the exact numbers of our online presence, but I know that the reach is quite large. But I do know that one thing that's interesting about the online initiatives is that it reaches a different audience. While a lot of our traditional audience in the museum would be um, families on weekends or perhaps uh, people who work in Makati, now we know that we're reaching people who are from far off places, from much more, a much more different uh, or rather a distant locality. So I think that that in itself is quite interesting. Um, it teaches us that our audience is no longer just the locality of where our museum is situated, but really we can look at the opportunity of going global with our educational content and also really reaching out and enriching uh, the people that we engage with. Okay, um, Sir Ricky? Oh, I know. Um, we've always had a uh, good engagement and whenever we go out of the museum and go to malls or go to other places. But looking at this afternoon, pa lang, um, our, our viewership is ranging from 900 to 1,200 throughout mm -hmm. this time. And they're from all over the Philippines. So I think we are. And on top of that, uh, another anecdote, um, we've been posting um, our Senso masks lately. And some of the people that have been trying to buy from us are in Dubai, are in America. Oh. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, so it's nice. That's our, this is opening a lot of audiences for us. Okay. Um, I'm glad that we have a silver lining for us museums, even amidst this very crazy, crazy pandemic. So before we close out, do you have any last words that you guys want to say to our audience? Um, let's start with Turkey again. Okay. Um, during this pandemic, especially during the ECQ, a lot of us felt very isolated. Art, art has the power to connect. Um, we've shared a lot of memes, na yung mga kumakanta from different parts of the world. Art connects us, so please visit us all and often because you know, there's a lot to learn from in our um, online pages, Instagram. Uh, visit us often, so it's it, this is for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Really, thank you ben, to ben? Okay. Um. Yeah, I just like to build up on what Ricky had said, that really the reason why museums exist is really for the public. Uh, it's really an act of service. So I think that people should not be hesitant ever if they have questions, requests. Uh, we can always work together to see what can be done, especially when it's closely tied in with our mandate of uh, educating uh, and preserving our rich history and culture. Okay, last but not the least, Janine. We are all in this together, especially because everyone is struggling with blended learning. What is it? 
uh, is are you prepared with the content? Do you have laptops? Do you have cell phones and all that? So, you know, the museums are with you. We will help you with content. We have our museum programs. Please, please feel free. Since now that you've seen our faces, you know who we are. We are people behind the, the even if the institutions look so intimidating, please feel free to get in touch with us through our emails. That's why we shared to you all our contacts. There. Okay. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. You can get your certificates through the link by Vibal, which we will post on the comments and the event page. So it's very important that you do follow the event page. And yeah, you can catch our next live stream on August 1 at 2 p.m. So that's next Saturday, August na po. At the following pages, at the Vibal Group, Chinatown Museum, and Iloilo Museum of Contemporary Art. We'd like to thank Fundacion Senso and Ayala Museum for collaborating with us on this very informative live stream. So our next show will be on how teachers can use collections from historical museums. So for today, if we discuss art museums, next week it will be historical museums to support digital learning. We also encourage you to RSVP on the next event pages so that we can keep you posted for updates and the releasing of certificates. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day.